This is December 3rd of 2013, and my name is Jean Morgan from the uh, Oral History Project from the Louisville Historical Museum. And I am here today with uh, Claudia Lund of the Lafayette Miners Museum. She's the curator there. And um, observers here are Becky Alexander and Mark Miller and Lois Wanaka, and we are going to be talking today to Alan Dean Miller, the great-grandson of Mary and Lafayette Miller, and lifetime Lafayette resident Chuck Wanaka. So thank you very much, folks, for being here today. And I'd like to start uh, with you, Dean. Would you give your full name, please? Alan Dean Miller. And. Um, why do they call you Dean, if, if that's not your, if that's just your middle name? No, it goes back to the day that I was born, mm -hmm. because my parents wanted to call me Dean, and so they were going to name me Dean Allen Miller. But my dad, being the joker that he always was, said, "You know, Billy, that's going to be they're going to that's his initials are going to spell damn, and if we name him Dean Allen." The kids are going to give him fits when he's in school. So we better name him Alan Dean Miller. So that's why they've called me Dean. It's been a pain in the neck. So now that's why I go by Alan Dean on all my legal stuff. I see. Um, do you, did you ever have a nickname? Nope. A lot of people in Louisville had nicknames, but not so here. No, I did not. All right. And would you give your date of birth? So uh, goes back to December 9th, 1926, and it was about 3:30 in the afternoon, as I remember. As you remember. Mm -hmm. So your birthday is coming up now. My birthday is coming up in just a few days. Well, happy birthday to you! Just let the yeah let my the relatives this, know. This will be my birthday present. Thank you. And where were you born? I was born in the Boulder Community Hospital, and on the way to the hospital, when my folks got over near, um, oh, there was a school east of Boulder, just at the bottom of the hill. Yeah. yeah. The, the roads were slick. They were, they were icy that day. It was a cold, bitter day. It was, my mother said it was very cold. And my dad did a 360 in the middle of the highway, and she almost had me there, but she waited until we got to the hospital. So I was born in the hospital. Well, I'd like to um, start with your great-grandparents, um, who were, of course, Mary Elizabeth Foote Miller and Lafayette Miller. And um, I wonder if you have any stories or any information you'd like to tell us about that maybe uh, hasn't been told? Well, I I never knew them, of course, because they passed away long before I came around. But um, the only thing I know about them is what I've read and the records that, that uh, we have in, uh, in the historical society. And, and then I've picked up a lot of stuff from the genealogy program that I have. And you've written a lot of their genealogy. Yes. Too. Mm -hmm. And Chuck, what do you call that historical society again? You want me to say historic, hysterical society. That's what I thought it was. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's, it is kind of hysterical when you get a group together like that and get a lot of different opinions flying around, but it's I don't mean to hurt anybody's feelings, but... I think no. it's fun. <laughs> well, any things that you want to add to this discussion, we certainly welcome you, Chuck. Okay. Then, um, Dean, if you would... Uh, I know the next generation, then, had five sons and one daughter. And um, do, you, do you want to lend any information about that uh, generation? I can name them, or you can... No, you mean my dad's generation? Uh, no, the one that George Ira was in. Thomas Jefferson, Charles... Yeah, and, and I... Um, 
Chuck probably knew my grandfather better, more than, better than I did because he was enough older. And my grandfather died, uh, I was only about three or four years old when he died. But I do remember uh, visiting him on the ranch, um, being in the barn uh, in the in the old in the Miller Ranch house. I, the the one the one really good memory that I have of my grandmother Miller was that she made these wonderful big soft sugar cookies, and they were wonderful when they came out of the oven. But um, my my memories of the ranch house in, on the, on the old Miller farm is very uh, hazy. Now, when you say your grandmother, that would be Mary Hake. Yes. All right, and she was married to George Ira. That's correct. And where was this ranch then? It was. It's a mile south of town, um, on the east side of the highway. East of 287? Yeah. Public Road. It's on Henning Boulevard at about a mile, not quite a mile, east of uh, the public highway. And by Henning Boulevard, is that South Boulder Road? Yes. And you called it Henning Boulevard? Yes. Do you know why? Mm -hmm. um, just because George Henning used it a lot to get between his two mortuaries. And I don't know where the... <laughs> where it came from, but we always called it Henning Boulevard. Want to add anything to that? No, I really really don't know <clears throat> why it is named that. I know our family called it, referred to it very often as uh, Henning Boulevard, but I just imagine he had so many funerals going up over that hill and processions going that, that had something to do with it, but I, I have no definite reason. Well, I know uh, one of your kin married his one of his daughters also down the line. So, um, all right. So, just pausing for a moment with that generation. I know Thomas Jefferson, the first son, I believe, was a supervisor at the Strath Strathmore mine. Strathmore, but he uh, he died a very violent death in the mines, didn't he? I did not know him at all. And um, I really didn't remember that he died a violent death. I, I have read that, and I wondered if it was... No, I, I do not know. Okay. The Strathmore had been shut down many years before Dean and I were, were uh, born, or can remember any of them. But he was supposed to have been heard to have died in Strathmore and died of his injuries. Uh, Chuck, just just to put uh, dates on some of these things, could you give your birthday too, so we can kind of refer back to that date? February 11, 1921. Okay. So we need to remember that on yeah. Valentine's Day. Hard to remember. All right. Mm -hmm. Then from George's, George then had three children: Frank Hake, Ralph Clinton. And William Lafayette, whom they called Faye. Correct. And then Frank is your father. That's that correct. correct. Now, would there be anything you'd like to talk about that generation, Frank, Ralph, and Faye? The only thing I could say about my dad was he never met a stranger. And... Um, in the early days, before I was born, he, he farmed and he worked in the mines. And the year that I was born, he got, he got his job as a mail carrier out of the Lafayette Post Office, a rural mail carrier. And uh, that ended his working at the mines and all of that, all of that stuff. So... Um, he was a great guy, and he he really had a heart. And oh, it goes back even even to the to the, his getting the job as a mail carrier. He um, he was a Christian. He knew Christ as his Savior, as as I do, 
And um, one of the things that he promised the Lord was, because, because he was gifted with this job carrying mail, that the, that the boys in the community would never lack for a leader. And so he was, uh, he was the scoutmaster in Lafayette for about uh, 30 years and was a dad to a lot of the boys in that town. Well, did you know that recently um, a scout, an Eagle Scout, just put the garden in at the Lafayette Miners Museum in the back off the alley? I had heard that. So that tradition mm -hmm. is still yes. alive Good. in Lafayette. Good. Anything more about that generation then, Ralph Clinton Sr.? Or no, I did know my Uncle Ralph pretty well and uh, spent a lot of time at at their house in the early days, uh, Clinton and I managed to get into enough trouble. That was his son. Yes. Yes. And, um, but, uh, uh, no, I, I don't think there's anything else that I need to share. Do you know, I've seen Faye Spell, the other son, William Lafayette. Was it F-A-Y or F-A-Y-E? They called him Faye, F-A-Y. Because his name was really Lafayette, but um, he died when he was about uh, thirty. He was a young man when he died, and I never did know him. I heard he was very but, artistic. But but he was he was he had a special um, relationship with my dad. I guess they 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 were very close. And when I'd be working with my dad on some of the projects that, that we were working on together, he would oftentimes call me Faye. He would forget, and he'd just call me Faye. And it wasn't unusual for him to do that. But because of, and, and, and you mentioned uh, earlier the, um, in, in some of your notes, uh, talking about the, the depression, I really didn't feel that too much, but I look back on that. And my dad was a handyman in town, and I know now that that he had to do those kinds of things in order to keep food on the table, because his salary at the being a mail carrier wasn't all that great. Did you want to say anything about uh, your dad as a miner and? Uh wages or unions or any of that? Do you remember any of that? No. I, I never did know what the wages were. Um, my dad, used before he got this job with the government, um, did spend time down in the shafts, but he was always, he was the mechanical kind. He could, he could work with electricity and mechanics, and they always had him doing mechanical work. And so he worked in the, on the machinery down in the shaft and also in the tipple. And you think that would have been in the 30s or when? Yes, it would have been in the early 30s. Well, the early 20s, okay. early 20s. Because after, after 1926 then, he had this, the job carrying mail. Chuck, do you want to add anything about any of the mining that, that you that you recall as far as salaries or just any information you might have about that time period? Well, the first thing I would like to say that I I feel real honored to be able to be interviewed with this man. Uh, <clears throat> the Miller family and our family were close from way back. Uh, well, at one time they both ran uh, stage jobs. Along, along with the Harmons. But uh, my dad died when I was seven years old. And I think that was part of the reason that uh, I was involved with the Millers and the Harmons and a lot of the older people around Lafayette at the time. And we uh, we done a lot of things together, the, the Millers and our family. Uh, I can remember George and, and uh, Bernie, I imagine her name was Bernice, but she, and we, we were at their house several times and 
for, for dinner and one thing I remember about being visiting with those folks, Bertie, this was long before hearing aids and she was hard of hearing and when you got around those folks everybody shouted <laughs> and it, it, it's a kind of amusing for us kids at that time. But Dean, Dean's brother and I were really close all our lives. Uh, <clears throat> I played out at the Miller Ranch and and I can remember a lot of things that Harry and I did. The the original Ma uh, Harm, uh, Miller home was still standing, but it was used as a granary and we used to play in that and we, we'd done a lot of things and we went all through school together. You know where that Miller home was? Yes, it was on, on the uh, north, north side of South Boulder Road, oh, a little less than a half a mile east of I-20, of uh, 287. Public Road? Yeah, yes, yeah public, public Road. It was on the north side. There was a... Is it oh, still? No. It's still there? No. <clears throat> uh, the history of the home, the, uh, the original Miller home was still there, but it uh, said used as a granary when I, the one of us there that I can first remember was built in 1906. It was a beautiful two-story house. And then it was a small five-room house just to the east of it, about 30 yards, where Ralph and, and Helen Miller lived when they were first married. I can remember when Ralph got married because I was four years old and I went to the Chivalry with my folks and got a slap on a tail end for swinging my clicker before we got to the house and made a noise and let everybody know that we were coming. At that time, <clears throat> just to give you a little idea of what the Miller Ranch looked like, there was a large barn just off the highway and they had rigged up uh, a line, overhead line, that they could unload their hay wagons with a, a large fork and, and pull it with horses across this uh, cable into a feedlot on the north side of the road. And I can remember them doing, doing that. The Miller, Miller boys, were the first ones that I know of that ever bought a combine. And I can remember going out to some place in the farm and watching them combine and they were sacking the grains. It was very different than the day and putting in a chute and scattering the sacks out on the road, on, on the ground and they'd have to pick them up by hand. But the, the, for both Frank and Ralph were very good friends of our family. You mentioned the chivalry. Oh, you go ahead. Let him talk about the chivalry. I want to hear what a chivalry is. Well, after a couple got married, usually a group of friends would would have what they call the chivalry. They would come to them at night and make a lot of racket, and pull a lot of tricks on them. Sometimes they'd have, I know one that the groom had to push the bride down the street in a wheelbarrow and, and they were always supposed to be ready to feed a bunch of people and, and uh, everybody just had a good time. They celebrated people getting married. That's what it was. Uh, <clears throat> I haven't, uh, I, I, as a, sm a small boy, I was to several, but after I was all oh, 15, I don't think I ever heard of the shiver. And this was a surprise. They didn't yeah, know when yeah, you were they coming. didn't know when you were coming. But they had to have all and, this food on board. Well, they, they should have, yeah. And most mm -hmm. of them knew, knew that they had a time. <clears throat> but <clears throat> when we went to the Millers, they uh, we parked on the cross the uh, South Boulder Road to the south, and quietly walked up to the, the house. Nobody was to say a word. But they had given me as a small kid one of them little click clackers we call them and I wasn't supposed to make any noise until I got there but just as we were going through the gate I had I was tempted and I, I 
made the first notice anyhow. My dad better clacking me on it back a little bit, but uh, it was it was a great <coughs> great deal to go to the Millers. The, uh, I had an uncle that worked for the Millers before he was married, and <coughs> we uh, we just always had a good good time. Going back to my grandfather. Frank Hay. I No. No, Ira. George. George Ira. George Ira. Yeah. My dad said that George Ira was uh, he was more of a gambler really than he was a farmer. And and um, he would get these whims. Some day some days my dad said they never knew how many how many cows they were gonna milk because he might sell them. Just get a whim and sell them. Anyway, he was a gambler, and he had a pretty good, fast racehorse. And south of the of the Boulder Road, there was a they had built a horse racetrack. And um, this fellow came through the country one day with a fast racehorse. And so my grandfather put up the bet. And he really mortgaged the farm, which which he shouldn't have done. But anyway, he mortgaged the farm and bet this guy that his racehorse was faster than than the visitor's racehorse. So they staged this racehorse. They staged this race. And my grandfather did win. And my dad said when they took all of the winnings... They carried it in, and he said, they, we put that pile of money on the middle of the dining room table at the ranch. And he said, I never saw so much money in my life. And so he said it was a real, very good day. My word. That's one story I remember about my grandfather. There were a lot of racetracks. That, there was my grandfather east of town here had, had a racetrack, horse racing. And he used to go to, go to uh, Erie. Erie had a racetrack, horse track. But that was just kind of a exercise for that time of the living is to have something to do with race your horses. Well, if, if uh, we're finished with that generation, any, any other questions or answers for that generation? Then let's move on to... Frank Hake's children, who, of course, um, Dean, you're the second child there. Um, Harry Earl, the first, and then Lois, and followed you. Um, I might also mention that Ralph Clinton Sr. would be your uncle. We did interview him earlier, uh, and he's the man who married uh, Welcome Henning. Uh, no, that was no, Ralph Clinton Jr. Ralph Clinton Jr., right. I'm he, sorry. He was a cousin. Yeah. Yeah. Right. We, al Ralph we always called him Clinton. Had a son named Ralph Clinton also. Who yes. Ralph Clinton. And he's the one who married Welcome. Yes. Thank you. Um, so then, just to clarify uh, who is here today, your brother Harry's daughter, Rebecca, is here today. Is that that's cool. yeah, correct. That's, yes. And then also your son, Mark Allen, is here today. That's correct. Um, anything you'd like to say about that ge your generation of um, Millers? No. Um. <laughs> Any good stories there? <laughs> oh, I've probably got a lot of good stories I could tell, but... Uh, um, I would say that I had a a normal childhood. The the um, we played outside a lot. We didn't have these things that people run around looking at like this all day long. Mm -hmm. um, we had things to do, and my mother and dad uh, knew that a busy boy was a boy that couldn't get in trouble. So they always tried to have me busy, doing something. And um, as a young lad, I did most any kind of a job that came along. I um, 
Luckily enough, when I was in high school, I worked for people like Chuck and uh, Will Harmon and uh, Guy Harmon and Ray Harmon and Gus Monica and... Um, but it was hard work. It was hard work on a farm, and uh, it wasn't uh, it wasn't anything that I shirked. And and uh, fortunately, there was a clothing store in town owned by Jake Alderson, and um, they allowed me to buy my clothes there. If and and I paid paid for most of my clothes at fifty cents a week. Gloves, boots, uh, shirts, whatever I needed. I would go buy it and put it on. And Chuck's mother worked at that store. And uh, her name was Bessie. And uh, Bessie knew when I came in I needed something in the way of clothing. And she'd put it on my account. And then when I'd get paid, well, I'd take in and pay it off at 50 cents a week or whatever I could afford. And that was how I bought my clothes. And this store was down on East Simpson? Mm -hmm. What was that? It was the store down on East Simpson? Yes. Down, down yes, East it was down in what used to be the old the old business district. Yeah. yeah, it was on the south side of the street. There's a story about that store. And George Miller always wore a western hat. And... It didn't have the regular crease down the middle like most people. It had four dents. I don't know how to explain it. There, he took the crown and, and dented it in four different places. And they had a brim that was always line of line brim. It wasn't a raw brim on his hat. And Jake Allerson uh, bought the hats for George. Well, after George died, my mother worked at the store. I used to spend quite a bit of time there, like on Christmas. I was a kid that was hired to pull all the shirts back on the rack and all the shoes back in the rack when they sold them. And, and Mr. Alderson <coughs> told me that he'd bought this hat for, for furnished George the hats, and he had one on when George died. I want to know if I wanted to buy that hat. And I don't know whether he gave it to me or I bought it, but I had George Miller's last hat. And... I, I wore it for a long time until it was nothing but a rag, oh. but I had his hat. Very nice. The Miller family, if I might add, had done a lot of things. And when my uncle was working for him, he, t he took this, he, he called them a string of horses, but I don't know how many, could have been two or twenty. Up to North Park, the Millers were involved in something in North Park at one time, and they built a, a irrigation canal, starting to irrigate some some ranch or something. And my my uncle who worked for the Millers went went there to uh, take take the horses, and he he told me how he went up over Cameron Pass, which at that time was just more or less a trail. And whatever, wherever it was or whether they owned it, we, we don't, we don't know whether they, just the particulars about it, but whatever the, they done. They built this canal along the side of a mountain, and the first time they turned the head of water in it, it broke out and all ran down. To, and that was the end of the project. <clears throat> but the Millers were involved in that somewhere or another, and that would be before before 1909. Now, was was your family also involved in that stage stop out there at the Goodhue Farm that's on 287? Just uh, North of Broomfield, where the railroad. Are you talking to me? Uh, either one of you. Uh, I think his, it was his, my, his folks. It was, it was my. It was my. It was my grandmother. That uh, ran that stage station for a that while. Would be Mary. Mary yeah. Hague. Yeah. Mary yes. Mary to George. Mm -hmm. Yes. And she ran that. Yes. How many years did she run that stage stuff? I have no idea. 
We have the a- only the only story that I remember from that was that um, when Jesse James was traveling through the country, the stranger came through one day and had dinner there and moved on. And she always did say that she she had probably fed Jesse James mm-hmm. at that stage mm-hmm. station. But I don't know other than that. I asked one of the boys, I don't know if it was Frank or Ralph, at one time, uh, <clears throat> what if they ever kept a, a, a book at the stage, stage station that people had to sign in when they stayed there all. And he said they they had a record and it was given to the Well County Museum. Now whether that's true or not, I uh, I asked one time when I was over there, and that's been many years ago over in Well County, if they had such a thing. And they, I think the story they gave me that they would have to do a tremendous tremendous amount of research to see that far back. But there was a lot of stuff given to the Well County Museum from the Miller family. wonder why Weld County rather than Boulder County. I don't know why. I uh, don't know why they were, they founded the town, but they were buried in Boulder. Yeah. A lot of questions like that, we don't know. Uh, Dean, did you, did you spend your whole growing up, your childhood, you were, you were here in Lafayette for how long? Until I was married. And that would be what year? Well, it would be from 26 through um, 50, uh, 51. 51? 52. Okay. All right, do the math quick. <laughs> Spent a lot of years in Lafayette. Okay, 26 years here. 26 years, most of which was spent on East Cleveland Street at 408 East Cleveland. The house is still there. It's a block south of the what used to be the main drag. And um, the house is still there. Second it was half. kind of an interesting house because if there was any remodeling to be done, we did it. And uh, the house had had been put together by taking parts of three different houses. And uh, so when you got up in the attic, there were three different gables under the roof. And and so, but we we rewired. We took one time we took all the lath off and put drywall up. We uh, we redid the hardwood floors. We were forever in a day putting the linoleum down, and uh, we built an addition on the back. Even dug a basement, right. hand dug a basement, and hand wheeled the dirt. My dad made ramps that we could wheel the wheelbarrow up out of the out of the basement, and then he made another ramp that went up, and then we took the dirt out and dumped it in the trailer, and then hauled the trailer to the dump or wherever somebody needed fill dirt. Anyway, so we had done, we we were forever and a day remodeling. So this and was it, you and Harry and Frank, your dad? Well, yeah. Harry, Harry helped a lot, but uh, he seemed to be able to get out of work pretty easy. Mm-hmm. And he always had something to do with Chuck. And they always had different plans. But yeah. no, Harry, Harry did help on the basement and some of the other, but when it came to most of the remodeling, uh, he didn't get into that too much. Just you and your dad. And I, and my dad taught me to be a craftsman and use tools and think about those kinds of things. And so I, I, I owe my dad a, a lot because he taught me to do things. When you were um, a child, then you must have gone to. Lafayette, which school did you go to Pioneer? I went to the old, I went to the old grade school. Which is now Pioneer. Well, the building isn't even there. Oh, where was there was it? a there was an old grade school that sat um, in the soccer field. Yeah, 
toward the soccer field. East of the other building. He's a the, pioneer? Right across the street from the, uh, the cleaners. Yes. Okay. Yeah, and the antique store. Yeah, it was, yeah. It was a three-story building. Big high gable, had a belfry. The school bell rung every morning. Um, and Good eventually fire. it burned. Didn't it burn down? Yeah. Yeah, it don't is. ask who started it. <laughs> Well, no, we won't get into that, Chuck. But anyway, that school building burned down, and then I and then I spent my my um, seventh, eighth grade through senior high at Lafayette High School, which is still up here. Was a cheerleader during my junior and senior years. Couldn't play fo couldn't play football, so I was cheerleader. So Lafayette High would then be now called Pioneer on base. Yeah, I guess. Is that right, Chuck? It was Lafayette High School all my life. And talk about this cheerleader. We, that was something unusual, wasn't it, to have a fellow be a cheerleader? Yeah, but uh, I couldn't play football. I have a wore a skirt. Didn't you? <laughs> no, I didn't wear a skirt. I wore slacks. <laughs> I've got a I've got a picture that shows you that I didn't wear a skirt, but um, no, but had two female cheerleaders, and so you know, there were three of us, and well, that, that, we we led something. the cheers for the track team, for the football team, for the basketball team, you name it, we we did the cheerleading. Yeah, I can remember some of those names, but. Uh, that was a great advancement. When I was in high school, we didn't have male cheerleaders. No. Uh, <laughs> so do you, do you know a cheer? Do you remember your cheer? you want to give us a cheer? I forgot mine. <laughs> How about you, Dean? <laughs> now, we were called the Bobcats. Our mascot was the Bobcats. <clears throat> and uh, we were called the Bobcats. But, um, yeah, we, we, we had good... We had a good cheerleading group. Well, Harry and I tried to be the people who they were cheering for. Yeah. That's the difference. They, they, Chuck, and, Chuck and Harry were out playing football. We, we, we spent a lot of time together. I might tell you, right where I think there's a, a, a Mexican store now. It used to be a post office, and before it was a, a, a vacant lot. And it's catty corner from the old blanket chips lunch counter and the second block, the last block on the west side of Public Road and the first block of past Simpson, Cleveland on Cleveland. And there was a fellow, a family in town at that time, the Keller family, and one of the boys sold cars. And he had that lot full of uh, second-hand cars. Harry Miller was going with Phil Romano. And we walked up there one night, he and I, and Phil, nobody was home. And we were sitting in a, one of those old cars waiting for somebody to come home. And the, the town cop drove a pickup. And he pulled in the the uh, blanket chips lunch at Caddy Corner from where we were sitting. Just far enough that it was on the east side of the building and we just see the back end of that pickup and we could tell when he got out of the, the door on the driver's side. And having nothing else to do, we picked up a bunch of brick from alongside Romano and took a jack out of the car. And we went over and we jacked up that that police pickup and put the bricks at her and took the jacket and went back and got it. And he came out of the, he got in it and we could just see the door swing as he got, got in. And then the wheels spun. And then the wheels spun. And then the wheels tried the other way. And then he put it in low gear or high gear or something and really revved it up and the vibrator and nothing fell off the brick. And it blew red ash. The, the red ash it was uh, the parking lot was uh, paved with red ash. 
It blew up clear across the street. And, uh, <laughs> the heck was her name? I forgot the family that lived there. And then it took hold and shot out the other side of the parking lot. <laughs> and Larry and I laid the car just laughing at the attack. And here the cop came back up the street. See, we were both laid over in a car and hit. And, and we knew we were in trouble if he recognized a brake or looked around. So as soon as he went by, we we got up and went down to Harry's house. But we thought that was quite an accomplishment. We backed up a police car. <laughs> Is this the first time you've been caught in this story, or did the cops ever come to No, they, ne they never come and caught us. Thank but you. Harry worked in that uh, uh, <clears throat> little restaurant. Worked all night, and there was a yeah filling station just to the south of it, and they had a <coughs> fellow by the name of Shadow McGann. I was running that at night, and Shadow come running into the restaurant to where he was. Nobody else around, and it was midnight or after, and I said he thought somebody was working on a, a, a part of a car that was in the back. So Shadow went around the filling station in one direction and Harry went around the other and he got on the south side, there was an old fender living laying there and he jumped that fender. But they laid the fender there to keep people from walking into a pit, a water pit. And Harry landed in that water pit with his white apron and his white pants that he'd been serving malts with. And the results were that they closed down the restaurant while Harry went home and changed. He had to go down Cleveland Street and change his clothes. But there were several things happened in our life that were kind of <clears throat> you can't you can only do it once, you know. <laughs> but we we had a lot, we had a lot of fun. Yeah. Another thing you don't know, <clears throat> Dean said he didn't know it, but Harry started school at, uh, when I did. 1927, yeah. And the second day of school in, in the third, in the second grade, Frank Miller came to ta came to school and took Harry out and put him back in the first grade. And we never did know why. And nobody ever mentioned it before because he. he how can you flunk the first grade? You couldn't say it. It, it wasn't like he didn't do good. <laughs> we, we still remained really good friends all year long, only I graduated year ahead. Yeah. And we went together uh, to a lot of different things, many, many times. And, <clears throat> but uh, Good times. Yeah. Lois Jane just handed me pictures of the, of the old school where, when it was burning. So, so these are pictures, and I don't know whether you can. We'll take some photos of those after. Yeah, but anyway, those are. Uh, I Thank never. I, yeah. I knew that it burned, but I didn't. Well, I didn't know that who had wanna, pictures. Want any history? We we were tearing it down. That that happens to be the only thing in my lifetime that I ever been on to to do something else was tear the grade school down. <coughs> and I lost a bid by, oh, I don't know, it was several thousand higher and several thousand lower than, than me, and it, it went for a ridiculous. <coughs> Did it burn for quite a while, like a couple of days? No. How, no, how it, 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 it started a little after luncheon, yeah, okay. and we were walking right right into it presently, yeah. Before dark, but it uh, it burned out. It was so hot. We had we had a volunteer fire department. <laughs> Most things burned to the ground. <laughs> well, yeah, it, it, we never we never were successful at getting things you, put you, out. You can you can imagine how I was on this, that building that's across the street now that is the cleaners. Yes. I was on a roof with a garden hose spraying the front of the roof. Well, that building burned, and I had to turn the hose on myself every few minutes. And my boy Bill laid on a gutter, and what's in front of the in the front of the 
antique store and continuously sprayed the front of that building. Somebody, uh, a fire department from Louisville came and there was a hydrant out in front and they went to hook up on that and somebody left a fire jacket laying on the sidewalk. They're not supposed to burn, but that one did. And it was at least 60, 80 feet from, from the burning building. I've got a date of May 17th, 1964 on yeah. that picture. Yeah, we had the roof off. We had all the flooring off the, the auditorium. And it was, believe it or not, there were 30-foot tuba 12s in there, lapping over in the middle of that auditorium. All ready to, we were going to haul them off Monday. And it was all lost. Now... I, I'm wondering, you talked about being a, a cheerleader, and I think your family didn't know that. I didn't know. And I wondered if they had any questions to ask you. Uh, and why couldn't you play football? Why, didn't, why weren't you a football player? Unfortunately, when I was born, I was born with two extra vertebrae in my neck. And it causes a severe spinal curvature. And I found out, we found this out when I was in the ninth grade. And the doctor said, you dare not play football because a sharp blow to the chin could break your neck and maybe paralyze you. So I've known all these years it was going to bother me. And that's, that's the reason for the oxygen today. But because I couldn't do that, then I chose to do other things. And I tried running in track, was not as good a half miler as Chuck and my brother, but tried the half mile, tried some sprints. Even when I was a freshman at, at uh, university, I tried out for the track team. But um, I could run the I could run the quarter miles just on the time until I got somebody in front of me. And once I got somebody in front of me, I lost all desire. So I was never much of a track man. But anyway, that was the reason then that since I couldn't play football, I would, I, and I went to all of the football, basketball games. Everybody did. Everybody went to the games. And so that was why I became a cheerleader. I'm surprised there were just three of you. As cheerleaders, I don't need, we have huge teams well, of cheerleaders. Don't need as many as the university because there's not that many people. Well, they, <coughs> they shouted awful loud. <laughs> they were louder. <laughs> did you do any fancy backflips? Oh flips no, no, no. We and, we did the basic jumping up and down and throwing the pom poms and <laughs> megaphone and all that business, but not anything fancy. <clears throat> any no. Well, thank you for that tidbit. That, that's news to the family. Uh, what sort of, um, I think we've got about 10 minutes left on this tape. Let's continue with the school years. Uh, what kind of games did you play when you were a kid? You know, little kid or a older kid? Or Mostly kids? running, hide and seek, kick the can. Um, anything that took us outside. And um, we dug a lot of caves. We, uh, I made a lot of chugs, a board with four wheels and a steering wheel. Tried taking it up on the Simpson Mine dump one day and was dumb enough to not be wearing uh, heavy clothes. And the thing tipped over and I scratched myself from head to toe right down the front of me but uh, and then when I was um, 11 or 12 I entered the soapbox derby in Denver two years and um, I have pictures of those of those racing cars which I'll share with you. Thank you. Did you do well at that? No I think I won a couple heats and and once you were defeated, then you were out. Mm -hmm. But um, um, it was it was an experience, mm -hmm. and uh, an experience that I wouldn't. I, I'm glad that I did it. Were there other children in in Lafayette who did this uh, soapbox? Only uh, the second year that I was in, 
the son of the grocer, Roy um, Roberts. Roy Roberts, his son Stan. I gave Stan my old car and built a new one. And I went out to the Morrison mine and got got a ten dollar fee from the from the man that ran the mine, owned the mine, because you were allowed to you were allowed to use ten dollars to build this racing car. And uh, the wheels cost you seven. And if you wanted to really be in the race, you had to buy the Goodyear wheels and axles. And so that left three bucks left for whatever to get the racing car built. But it was it was an experience that I would that I cherish. Uh, did you remember any, uh, besides this extra vertebrae in your back, do you remember any illnesses and what people did to, uh, you know, your doctors? What, uh, going uh, going to a school like Lafayette, if there was whooping cough, uh, uh, measles, chicken pox, you name it, we had it. We took turns. <laughs> And and there and and sometimes half the town would be quarantines, but we went. We 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 had everything that came down the pike. So when they say if you've had chicken pox, well you may have shingles someday. Well, so be it. We all had chicken pox when I was a kid. There was a diphtheria epidemic when I was oh, yeah. about second or third grade, I believe. That really yeah. Heard a lot of people around there. There was a house right across the road here that uh, lost three kids with diphtheria. Did you have diphtheria? No, I never did either. But my, it was my it mother was, came up and helped a lady out. They had, I think, they had five or six kids. Yeah, and she took a lot of scolding for coming leaving us. You know, we were both just little kids. But uh, <clears throat> there were there were a lot of ch children lost. Didn't they? Did they used to put these packs on your chest, the cold pack or what? I don't know. Mustard, mustard pack. Do you Must, remember yeah. that? Oh yeah, mustard. Oh yeah. Well, when my dad died, he he was only out of the field six days, and he got pneumonia. And we found the records after my mom passed away that uh, all they had done was. Put on mustard plasters and give him hypos. Now, what the hypos were for, I have no idea. Maybe to just settle him down or something. I don't know how, how he would respond. But it took him in a hurry. He never even went to hospital. That was that was unusual. Do you remember any of the doctor's names here in town? Yeah, Doctor Braden, Doctor Porter. Doc Braden was the one that brought me into the world. And I uh, played with his grandson. His grandson was a kid from Chicago. Mm. But he came out here every year and spent the summer in Lafayette. And yeah. he was eventually killed on Long's Peak because he, came, he became a mountain climber. And he was on his, I don't know, the 11th try up the east face of Long's Peak and grabbed for a rope that was dangling and fell about a thousand feet to his mm -hmm. death. Dr. Braden's motto was let nature take its course. Mm -hmm. I see. And I think a lot of people died. <laughs> 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 and Doc and Doc they both live close. Doc Porter was about the same. <laughs> yeah. Is there another doctor else? Uh, not that I know of here we had Doctor Bixler. Excellent. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. How's our time running? Are you? Five minutes. All right. Well, um, we've got five more minutes on this tape, but we'd love to do another hour if you're up for it, and we'll just continue on. Um, junior high and high school, um, some of your activities there you talked about. Did you play any? Was there baseball that you played? No, they Quite tried. We tried. We tried to get a baseball team, but um, it never was successful. So the main the main sports 
were, were football and basketball and track in high school. And they never had track here until I was a sophomore. Yeah. And what yeah, about track a bit? I'll take, take that back. They, they had it years ago in 1914. Carl Swagger won the state meet by himself, taken first in five different events. Was later a track coach at East High when I was in high school. And in 1910, it, uh, Lafayette won the state basketball championship with two Harmons. In it. One of the things when I was a kid that was big in Lafayette was the fire hose team. Yeah. And um, I've got a picture along to show you that they won the championship, I think, in uh, 27, wasn't it? 1927, it's about that about that time period. But um, World Championship. World Championship. I don't know where that was held. I think it was in Boulder. And um, I, my dad was on that team. My Uncle Ralph was on the team. Uh, and Chuck and I were looking at the picture this morning. A lot of people that we knew were on that team, on that host team. We'll get a picture. We'll get a copy of that. And, and, uh, and, and they always practiced on the east end of Cleveland Street, a block east of where, where we lived. And they set, had a ladder set up in a tree. Um, and they'd come running down the street with the hose team. The, I think the hose team was six men in harness and pulling like a, a team of horses would pull a, a cart. And, and one guy pulled the hose off. The other guy, he pulled the hose off with the nozzle. And the other guy would wait till the hose ran out and he would take the end and hook it on the on the fire plug and then they were timed to see how long it took them to get to get the on the plug and water coming out the nozzle and hopefully by the time the guy got to the top of the ladder with the nozzle water was worked out the and they used to practice that during the summer evenings and over on Cleveland Street Wouldn't they call it the wet test was yeah. that the wet test yeah the wet test wet test I ran on it three nights. I had a wreck. You what? I ran on it when I was when I was a senior in high school. Everett West, who was on on the uh, uh, fireman, came up and wanted Tom Fitchford and Lou Meaden and me to run on a host team. I never joined the fire department, but I I was practiced on Cleveland Street. And about the third night, or fourth that we ran, we had a wreck. We got our feet entangled with two Stannis boys and West and Tom and Lou. Who else? Said one more. And I didn't get hurt bad, but I got skinned up pretty bad on that gravel. And I never, never ran. I never belonged to fire. I couldn't belong to the fire department. I lived out of town. I see. But I ran out of, and I, I, I'm not sure. But that was one of the last times they they really run that that way because I got a picture of. I went along with it to the meet, and took a picture of the guys running, and I gave that to the fire fire department. Now whether or not they burn it or looked at it, I don't know. <clears throat> well, this tape is about out of time, but I'd like to start the next tape and maybe your recollections about rivalries between Lafayette and any other other towns that hit there, the There's only one other town. I, I'm going to leave that one. Yeah. So thank you for tape number one.